I love talking about designing property and what's interesting, uh, do you think we'll be able to hear that? I can cut it out. Oh, okay. Is that the AI yeah. uh, wizardry magic stuff? Oh yeah. Dylan uses wizardry in his editing to remove baby noises in the background. So we actually have two babies here. My oldest child, Autumn, who's 23, had my first grandson. Two days after, I had my last child, which will be uh, Lily. So she's my fifth child, uh, Lily and Jackson. My second round of kids are two years apart and uh, one day. And, uh, and then uh, Carson, my grandson, was born two days after that. So we have both babies here. It's awesome family time, and, uh, but sometimes it's a little loud uh, around here right now. <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, I love talking about designing these parcels. And when you go to so many... You can't just take a plan that's predetermined and just apply it to everything. There's a certain set of concepts you have to have. Now, a schooled approach of designing a parcel is this is a good spot for a waterway, a water system, a pond. This is timber management here. This is a great uh, field for native grass. This is good soil for food plot. And you just install with zero regard to how the deer or wildlife actually use the land based on your use too. And so that's where a huge amount of strategy comes in. You can't go to school to learn this. You have to learn how to whitetail hunt and do it yourself. Lots of different parcels, big public land woods. You have to know how deer work there. Small private ag, big private ag, big private wooded. You have to know all of that. And then you take those concepts that actually you can apply to all these areas and then you go out to client properties that's what we do so every one of these is so different this one right here is about 150 acres and it's for a friend more than a client but we'll just call him a client for right now so this was a little bit different one it was a quick look um, spent a half day out there looking around at it been a lot of conversations since on zoom and uh, text and phone call but this right here is a is a good example of the balance that people have to apply especially when it comes to ag one of these red areas on there i want them to stick out because those are the ag areas and with that ag i want to say out of this parcel let's just throw out there let's say there's 60 acres of ag but you can see where the ag's located the ag's located in this lower valley this is all valley right here this is the start of a ridge system on the west side on the east side up top it's all ag what that does is it fragments the parcel. It's a beautiful location. This is a big buck area that a lot of hunters across the country would dream to be at. I would not own this property if it had to remain in ag unless it was pure investment. Because the way the ag is situated, it fragments the parcel and it gives zero depth of cover. That's a concept that can apply to any parcel we go to. So you learn these concepts like Dylan, Joe, Wes, Kevin, that go to parcels, including myself, will go to over 300 this year. When you go to these parcels, if you know the concepts, it helps you make decisions of balance. Do you put food here? Do you put bedding here? And if you follow these concepts, it makes sense then, because then you can look at any parcel across the country that whitetails roam, and you can actually come up with a competent plan that gives you morning stands, afternoon stands, good access, and depth of cover. And so I wanted to talk about these key features here, but again, with this parcel, now I'm not saying I wouldn't buy this parcel. What I'm saying is, is that if I had to have the ag and I couldn't remove the ag, at least to a certain percentage, then I would not own this parcel because with the ag, it would be a bad parcel because it doesn't have depth of cover. That means mature bucks would have to live somewhere else, not on this land. I couldn't control a herd. I couldn't build a herd. I couldn't hunt target bucks and go out and depend on hunting them because if it's fragmented by ag, mature bucks don't live by the ag. They don't live by food plots. They don't live by major food plots. Does do. And if there's not enough space on the opposite side of where the food is from the does, then you're not going to have those mature bucks. And if you're placing mature bucks on your neighbors, that's why you don't like putting, that's why it's a bad idea to put food plots right next to your neighbors in most cases. In this case, there's a steep bank and ridge going over the neighbors. They're never going to be close to this. So the bedding area that you put on this over here by this smaller food plot, it's more of a hunting food plot. 
the big bulk of the food is in the middle of this parcel and to the south, that's just a pass through there. So the few deer you put there, the neighbor can't come and hunt very easily. So that's a good thing. But bottom line is if you're putting a big food source next to your neighbors and that's where all the deer live because of that food source, very bad decision. That means you should put cover there. So the opposite is true, but there's a lot of solutions for this. And the landowner in this case has to balance new relationship with the farmer. Do we take all the ag away? Do we not have that ag income? There's a lot of things to consider and we know that. That's why a lot of times food plots, especially when it comes to ag and how much you're gonna take over, you always wanna take over some stuff. We go to properties where, well, there's it's a 80 acre parcel, we have 30 acres ag, we don't wanna to touch the ag. Well, that's really bad because if you love whitetail, even if you take five acres out, it's the value of the ag versus the parcel is so small as far as it being an ag in the production each year, then why not take it out if you love whitetails? But in this case, you take this back portion, and I'm just gonna draw this in black, see, for illustration, because black is covering woods right now. So I wanna take this ag out of here. I wanna have switchgrass, cover, I want everything to be lined in switch. That'd be around this entire area as lined the ag field up above, the food plots on the outside that's all lined in, in switch, you know, all the way around here. So that's a given. Big bank of switch because there's gonna be an access point that comes up through a bottom ravine and then it pops up up here to get up top. You don't expose yourself. You Coming in on this, the, the temptation is, well, I'm gonna go along my south border. Well, that's up high. So if the south border's here and you're facing to the inside, then everything on this hillside can walk you come in, watch you walk come in. So if you keep your ravine and you keep your access along that ravine, build a road system, then you can stay low and then pop up when you need to, go through a heavy bank of switch around the outside edge and get into your stand. All that yellow is switch on the map that you're looking at. But I wanna, I wanna show this. So food plot here. So we're gonna have heavy screening before a food plot here. And this is all gonna be covered. There's a pond up here that you really can't hunt because it's so far interior, all that's gonna be cover. This is all cover around here. This is all going to be switch here. So what you're starting to do then is you're taking the bulk of the woods, and I hope this makes sense, but you're taking this, this, other than the axis down here, is all deer all the time, all the way through here. That is the efficiency of the parcel that holds depth. And you have food that complements that. So now you have the bulkier deer here. Your access is around that. You can get around this field up top. You access all the way around this outside. You can get into a stand here. It comes down to a point. That's a great morning stand. You can have stands at a water hole between the food. Or between the food, you can have another stand location. Stand back in the corner where they're accessing to get into the food. There's lots of stand locations. Uh, stand on a little hunting plot right here. You can pop up, hunt this flat. It's up above, you can't see it. You can have a stand location back here to hunt this little food source. There's already a shooting hut right around here. But bottom line is you have to have this big contiguous area where you're not getting into to actually spook deer. And then you're hunting around that with food. You're complementing that food. And then because your food is packed in around that outside, you can access, get around the ag, get around the food. You don't have to walk through that area. The worst part right up here, look at this finger. Let's say all that's in food. You just destroyed your ability to hold mature box. You can't have mature, you can't have deer, you can't have food in that finger there. You can't have food up here. So you gotta bring it down to the outside. Preferably, I'd like to see that food down here and even more cover up there because then that cuts that corner, you're constantly filling in that large area. That's where you can expect to hold mature box because you start to have depth. Because the food is located against that, then it gives you good access. And then you're using that food on the outside to give yourself access because food determines where access is. Access is determined by food, meaning you can never access that food. And then you get around the parcel. You can see we have a water hole up here on a point. It's all downhill from here, going to the east awesome spot for a water hole. I would not put a hunting plot there, for example, because it's not enough of a draw, just a little eighth of an acre, tenth of an acre plot in that location. A water hole is very powerful and it's season long, especially during the rut. Be a killer, remote. You put a, you put a food source there, 
Now you have a food plot that you should only be able to hunt in the afternoon because if you go in there in the morning, you might spook deer. Deer don't like going into an open food plot, even if it's only an eighth of an acre, quarter acre during the day, but a water hole they'll visit any hour of the day. So that water hole represents a great stand location in that spot that you can hunt morning, all day, and afternoon. Where if you put a food plot there, it becomes an afternoon spot and a more risky spot and a less attractive spot than a water hole up in that high bluff area where there's not a lot of water already. So that's another balance you have to assess. But water holes on a point here, up high between food sources on a bench, one over here, and then you start to fill in that outside area where you can have you can't realize on good points, good benches, good funnels with various improvements and good access to develop a plan. But again, if, if the person doesn't take that out of ag at least to some appreciable amount these points up here become all deer all the time surrounded in heavy ag you're starting to establish lines in the sand where you're saying yeah this is a food plot but everything from the outside of that food plot where i can hunt up against and all the way to the inside is all deer all the time right now when it's ag it's all blurred you know they spook when you walk through there's no screening lines and then when you have that switchgrass line against this edge what do deer do? They bed right behind that switchgrass. Right now, if you can just look right into the hardwoods or down into the hardwoods or up, you don't have that brush line, then the deer are bedding 50 yards in, 100 yards in. You lose that 50 yards times your field edge of actual holding cover. So if when you put that switchgrass along that edge, now deer bed just behind it, and you maximize, maximize that depth that you have that you're providing for all deer all the time. You're not spooking deer, you spread your deer more evenly, and then you actually give yourself room. If does and fawns are bedding to the outside near that food, which is what they like to do, then you free up space on the interior of the parcel for bucks. You locate your water holes, you have good access, you improve that depth, get rid of some of the ag. In this case, person could still keep 38 ag acres out of 50 or whatever that amount let's say there's 60 acres of ag there's still 45 acres 48 acres there's still an appreciable amount and it might be that in a perfect world you get that to 100 percent taken over for habitat but there's some really good appreciable steps that can affect the land greatly and positively just by taking 10 acres 12 acres 15 acres and still maintaining the bulk of ag so you can main, remain and maintain the relationship with the farmer and look at steps over time of taking a little bit back at a time but never another thing don't ever rely on the whims of the farming rotations to build your deer herd when you have corn one year and they like that in November because it was just cut awesome what if they don't cut the corn and they're not hitting it until December when they actually cut the corn or pick the corn what if they have beans one year and it's great early season I used to have friends that would rent a farm where it was beans and corn every other year they would hunt it for opening day and opening weekend in September if there are beans, but there's nothing there for rut because the beans were harvested and the whole property didn't have food on it. There are no food plots on it. So it destroyed the land every other year. If it's destroying the land every other year, how can you actually build a herd? How can you protect mature bucks, advance them to the next age class? So you can never rely on the whims of the farming rotation. It'll never work out in your favor ever, 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 ever. The farmer can say, well, I'll leave you beans. I'll leave you corn. Well, one year might be good. One year it's bad. They're in the wrong locations. So control your destiny by adding food plots. Make sure you have that depth of cover. Still, you can maintain the bulk of the ag. Maybe in, in the future, you say, well, we might get to a point where we're taking 30 acres out of 60, you know, 50%. That's as far as we go. That's, that's okay. Just getting 10 or 12 acres will get you 80% of the way there, 85% of the way there to a great wildlife plan. So I hope this makes sense. A little larger parcel. But I wanted to really illustrate the, the discussion and balance we often have with balancing um, taking back acres of ag. And uh, hope you can apply that to your own parcel, bigger or smaller, and have a great hunt and a great property going into this fall. Guys, it's food plot time, and I really urge you to check out our food plot company, Pure Wildlife Blends. It's called Pure for a reason. I invite you to check it out. We have food plot blends for all types and we try to give you all this content on YouTube, articles on the site to help you make sure you not only do it right, plant it right, but you pick the right seed blend for your circumstances.